this is quite interesting. The real cost of free. Now, I've always wondered about that. So I'm kind of excited to hear it. I know I am going to butcher her name. Um, Rachira uh, Pokria. I hope that is correct. If not, somebody will correct me. But let's kick it off. We all love free stuff, but we also know that not many things are actually free. The internet is full of free things to offer, one of it being free apps to make our lives a little easier. The popularity of free apps for smartphones have exploded in the last few years. But do they truly come without a cost? Do we ever pause to think that when we download a free app, we also give something in return? Hi, my name is Ruchira. I'm a cloud security specialist. And well, I think it's safe to say that there are a variety of hidden ways in which these so-called free apps can end up taking a lot more than just money from its users. Let's learn how. Okay, so before we dive deep into the session, let me tell you a little about myself. My name is Ruchira Pokhrial. I go by the pronouns she and they. My educational qualifications are bachelor's degree in computer science, master's degree in computer science, and a master's in cybersecurity. I've worked as a web application pen tester in the past, and I'm currently working as a cloud security specialist and volunteer incident responder at Amazon Web Services. You'd often hear and see me advocate for diversity and inclusion, um, specifically LGBTQIA plus visibility in tech, uh, women of color in tech, neurodiversity. And I also like to associate myself with organizations that are working towards encouraging more women to choose tech as a career path. Some of these organizations are Women in Cybersecurity, aka WESIS, Breaking Barriers, Women in Cybersecurity, aka BBWIC, and OASP, Women in AppSec. Uh, my social media handles are on the screen, so feel free to take a screenshot and connect with me later. Um, I would also be at the AWS booth, so you can catch me there. All right, without further ado, let's get started. Today's agenda for this presentation is fairly simple. Um, I will start by explaining you the difference between free and paid apps. How do free apps actually make money from your data? Why do companies gather this information in the first place? Why should you be careful about protecting your personal information? We'll discuss a case study, some pros and cons of free and paid apps. We'll discuss some real-life examples of um, companies that violated GDPR. Uh, finally, we'll end the presentation um, by discussing some best practices, concluding if free apps are actually dangerous, and I'll be sharing all my references with you, which I have used to prepare for this presentation. All right. So the first thing, why are some apps free versus some are paid? Uh, you might be really thankful to a company to give you a very useful app for free, but these companies still generate profit. Um, thanks to all of its users. How you ask? Um, okay, since app developers themselves won't charge users for their application, they resort to data collecting and sharing to make money. What this means is once you install a free app on your device, it will monitor your online activity and sell it to third parties. These parties can use uh, all of your information to display customized ads to you when you use the internet. And how do these applications record your data? You guessed it right, with cookies. Cookies are packets of data that internet servers send to browsers when users frequently visit certain sites. Web browsers and websites use them to track and gather your online activity information and sell them to other companies as well. So how do these free apps make money? If an application developer or company gives away an app for free, there's definitely some way that they are making money from it. And they can do this in a number of ways. I'll be discussing some here. The first one being online games. So applications like WeChat, which is a messaging app, earns money through 
their online games, which requires purchase to unlock special features. The next and the biggest uh, one is advertisements. So online advertising is a huge business and it is driven by the personal data that you share through a free app. Most free apps also earn money through advertising the products that you are most likely to purchase. So as a developer, if you create an app, you can make money by using Google AdSense to place ads in the user interface. And if you have a few million people already using your app, you can charge higher rates to advertisers, even though your app itself will be free to users. In app purchases, some applications will allow the user uh, to download the application for free, but they would require money to unlock certain special features. Um, Add-on services. Many free applications earn money by offering add-on services and they obtain revenue from providing a platform for these add-ons. Um, you've probably heard of Social Fixer, which is an add-on um, that makes Facebook um, or Meta infinitely better with its myriad of options, but this isn't the only tool which is out there. Other add-ons can make viewing photos easier. They will claim to remove ads and annoyances and much more. Um, the next one is a little scary. It's tracking. So some apps have embedded trackers in them that collect and share your data with marketing companies. And consumer data uh, these days is gold dust to these companies. They'll pay a very high price for it. So note that without ads and embedded trackers to make money from, trustworthy companies will ask users to pay for their services or will add a premium option that you will have to pay for to unlock full features. So that's your difference between free apps and paid apps. And I think nothing is truly free after all. The next very important concept, why do companies even care about gathering this information? So the type of information that software and applications steal from devices or capture from devices really vary, but they tend to include certain similar elements. Web browsers and other sites like to track people's shopping habits and interests. Then they share such information with other companies to show you related advertisements that might appeal to you. If the application can display ads that make you want to purchase something, then the companies gain profit. In this process, users' sensitive data can often be compromised. And this won't like, uh, sound like a big deal for some, but many companies can discover a lot about you through the data captured by these free applications or software. Not just that, but they can also share your data with other parties, which brings us to the next part of this presentation. Why is your personal information important? Um, so the most important type of information to keep private is your personally identifiable information, also known as PII. Uh, according to the U.S. General Services Administration, PII is information that can be used to distinguish or trace an individual's identity, either alone or when combined with other personal or identifying information that is linked or linkable to a specific individual. So some examples of PII are on the screen right now. The first one is names. This includes your full name, maiden name, and your mother's maiden name. Next is personal ID number. So this includes your social security numbers, driver's license, passport number, patient ID, taxpayer ID, your credit, credit account numbers, or any financial account numbers. Uh, the next is addresses, which includes your street address and email address. Biometrics, such as retina scans, fingerprints, facial geometry, or voice signatures. Um, your vehicle ID or title numbers your phone numbers, of course, and technology asset information, which is your media access control or internet protocol uh, known as MAC and IP addresses respectively. Uh, note that this list does not cover all the PII that you need to protect. Uh, one must truly protect or share this information very carefully though to prevent issues like identity theft and uh, uh, your financially information uh, being stolen from threat actors. Also, we must know that information is really a commodity. So software offering free services can collect, sell, and analyze user data on behalf of advertisers. So the information that we share 
for free is actually monetized. And every time you download a free app, you are giving away your valuable information in return, such as your browsing history, your SMS application, your contact list, access to your camera, access to manipulate your cookies. And this data is analyzed and used to deduce the advertisement content of products that you are most likely to purchase. This really means that you need to have policies in place to protect this information and should know exactly how your data and PII is being used. So in order to find out what kind of data um, data apps may be looking for, uh, Norton Life Law, commonly known as Symantec, analyzed the top 100 free apps listed on Google Play Store and Apple App Store in 2018. Uh, let's have a closer look at what they found. So you see this nice little graph on the screen. And one of the first things that Symantec looked at was the amount of PII that apps requested users uh, to share with them. Email addresses were the most common piece of PII shared with apps and were shared with 48% of iOS apps and 44% of the Android apps, which were analyzed. The next most common piece of PII was the username, which was shared with 33% of iOS apps and 30% of Android apps. Phone numbers were shared with 12% of iOS apps and 9% of Android apps. Finally, the user's address was shared with 4% of iOS apps and 5% of Android apps. Um, several apps also integrate with your social media channels so that the users can log into the application using their social media accounts and allow the app to post directly to their um, social networking sites. Um, so for the user, this really means that they don't need to manage passwords for every app. They can um, post uh, whatever they post on one app will be automatically posted to the other app, which is linked. Uh, they can invite their friends to play mobile games with them. Uh, they can share their app information on their timeline. But this also allows the app to collect more user data from their social, social media channels as well, while allowing the social media service to collect data from the application too. So it's also very important to know that aside from just personal information, Apps will also need permission to access various other features on your mobile device. And there's this massive amount of permission an app could request, but not, permit, not all permissions are the same. So for that reason, Symantec took a closer look at the so-called risky permissions. Um, these are called risky because uh, these permissions could potentially affect the user's store data or the operation of others' apps. Uh, Symantec found that camera access was the most requested common risky permission with 46% of Android apps and 25% of iOS apps seeking camera access. Um, that was closely followed by location tracking, which was sought by 44% of Android apps and 25% of iOS apps. 25% of Android apps requested permission to record audio, while only 9% of iOS apps uh, requested the permission to record audio. Finally, 15% of Android apps sought permission to read SMS messages and 10% sought to access um, um, to phone call logs. And uh, neither of those permissions are available in iOS. However, and here's where things get interesting. Semantic also emphasized that just because these permissions are called risky, that does not mean that they should not be granted. Instead, uh, they should be seen as permissions that the user should exercise more caution about granting um, while asking themselves if the app really does need this permission. For example, a taxi app would require you to provide your exact location to connect you to drivers nearby. But it's up to you to think that should an astrology app really have your exact location? And that's really for the user to decide. The next important difference that we need to know is between selling versus sharing user data. 
So companies that collect user data don't always sell it to other organization or data brokers. Instead, they will share it as a part of corporate partnerships. And many tech giants are no, known to do this with a variety of other software or social media firms. Um, this arrangement actually can be mutually beneficial in helping companies to capitalize on market dominance, grow their user base, improve their marketing, iterate on their products or services, and much more. Uh, sharing user data can also enable some companies to get around uh, certain stipulations of privacy regulations as no money is exchanged for the data. Do you remember those checkboxes for consent to share data with trusted pa parties or third parties? This is exactly what that is. The next thing you might often have seen um, while downloading an app is do not sell my personal information. Uh, we never really understood what this means, so allow me to explain. The CCPA actually requires company to clearly and prominently display or do not sell my personal information button or link on uh, web properties. This is only a legal requirement for companies doing business with California residents, but it is a good faith action for other companies as well. Um, and is um, actually growing in usage. This means that companies can continue to collect any non-sensitive data without consent from California residents. But if a consumer who can be verifiably linked to that data has requested it not be sold, then its use is limited to the company that collected it. So with the all what we have discussed so far, let's dive into some pros and cons of using free software or free applications. And despite everything that we have seen so far, free software still offers plenty of advantages. After all, these applications are necessary to have a functioning social, personal, and professional life. But uh, please remember that these pros don't apply to every free software or application out there. The first advantage is available at air quotes, no cost. So most software and applications like basic Microsoft Office require an initial payment or just a very small amount. Um, and it helps you get your work done. It, uh, it offers you a ton of features which are available for free. Others, however, won't even cost a dime. So it really gives you an advantage to complete your work uh, or your office chores without really paying a big amount. The next advantage is more freedom. So as a developer, you get to be creative and share your work with the world by developing games for entertainment or something that solves a social issue like safety of individuals who are traveling late at night. And application developers can develop and experiment with whatever they want and share their progress with the world just by following a couple of easy steps. The next advantage of free application of software is auditability. So open source programs really allow anyone to read and modify the source code. This means that tech savvy users can check for strange developments or undisclosed aspects uh, of an application as well. So Free software often comes with a lot of problems too. So let's discuss some of the cons as well. Um, these problems really include hidden malware because it's very easy for adversaries to hide malicious software and free applications. And these malwares can do anything from hacking into your phone to stealing bank logins and passwords to identity theft. Um, there's often lack of support and documentation for this, these free applications because the software creators will often not release their notes about the program's development. As a result, individuals who are using this free application cannot access the source code to see any changes or important information and updates about the app. Finally, the uh, one of the major cons is also app developers losing interest in enhancing the application. And this is a major problem with free programs. Uh, which is that developers will sometimes just lose interest and stop improving or updating them, leaving the app users confused and probably with a really vulnerable application on their phone. So why do free app developers really care about your data? Why do they want it? Um, 
So normally they really don't care about the data, but they know somebody who does. Um, as we discussed earlier, the user data collected in databases or these free applications is sold to companies who are interested in processing the information in order to sell it to advertisers, hedge funds, retail outlets, or even on the dark web. Uh, the most common case is uh, data being sold to ad agencies. Um, and the important thing to discuss here is location targeted adv advertising, which is now a huge business. Um, according to an article published on the New York Times official website, um, gives an estimate of $20 billion that was spent on location targeted advertising in 2018. Uh, the application developers usually have two strategies. They either directly sell their data or they share it for location-based ads, uh, which may indirectly influence the user to buy a premium account. Uh, so companies really look to understand who a person is based on where they've been, where they are going in order to influence what the user is going to do next. So it's pretty important for app users to understand that you only receive these services for free because advertisers are actually helping monetize and pay for it. Now, we mentioned location tracking a little bit. Let's try to discuss location tracking and how it really works. Are you ready? All right. So marketing companies would often offer app developers money in exchange for implementing a few lines of code into their apps. These are called software development kits or SDK. So now the SDK could have the capability of capturing all the user data that the app has access to. The app developers in return gets paid every month or every quarter. Marketers would use this captured location, location data to target advertising campaigns based on where you are and to measure whether an online ad actually drove you to visit a retail location of their choice. The goal is basically to understand your habits and ultimately get you to buy something. And because data collection for the purpose of advertising is either disclosed in really long-winded privacy policies or not at all, it's really difficult to tell which apps have trackers and which don't. So while there are advantages like reaching emergency contacts and taxi rides easily uh, by enabling location sharing, there are several disadvantages as well. Uh, first disadvantage is children can be tracked by predators. Criminals can also see when and where uh, you are going, if you're on a vacation or in your house which, uh, alone. And these informations can be found when we are traveling home at night as well. Uh, it's really interesting that even restricting the location access on certain apps might not necessarily prevent it from revealing your location. Abbas Raza Gappana, a researcher at Stony Brook University, actually found 581 Android apps, including dozens geared towards preschool age children, uh, made by a developer called Baby Bus. And it shared Wi-Fi access points, uh, names, and MAC addresses, which can be cross-referenced with a public database to pinpoint to your exact location. Isn't that scary? But that's actually not it. Location data can also be used to infer even more sensitive personal detail about you. Um, a company called Copley Advertising used phone location data to target young women near reproductive health clinics across the country, um, like Planned Parenthood, with ads from anti-abortion groups. Uh, additionally, uh, Another disadvantage of uh, location tracking is, let's say an employee who visits the same coffee shop for lunch each day or takes the same train home, they might have their valuables such as their uh, work laptop stolen with all the valuable business secrets. So tra uh, location tracking can actually uh, be stalking as well. Um, so if you are still not convinced how dangerous free apps and the data that they capture can be. Let's look at some real life examples. So 
these are some of the more famous real life examples of applications that go fined for violating general data protection regulation or GDPR. On January 19, 2022, the Italian Data Protection Authority publicized its decision to find the multinational electric and gas supplier called Enel Energia with $30 million for a range of GDPR violations, including failing to get user consent or inform customers before using their personal data for telemarketing calls. That's absurd. On October 5, 2020, the Data Protection Authority of Hamburg, Germany, fined clothing retailer H&M with 45 million US dollars. And according to reports, H&M recorded and stored gigabytes of one-on-one -on -one conversations with their employees. The uh, Hamburg Data Protection Authority also found that the personal details revealed the recording and storage of those details. The fact that multiple managers had access to this data and that this data was also being used to make work-related decisions violated the GDPR and also infringed on employees' civil rights. Finally, Grindr, the popular gay dating app, was also fined $7.2 million US dollars for selling data that tracked the precise movements of millions of its users beginning in 2017, which may also have led to the outing of several people. Um, the data, which was purchased by clients of a mobile advertising company, allowed unknown third parties to know sensitive information about users, including whom they were dating, where they lived and worked, and where they spent their free time. So if you are by any chance still not convinced that a free app could be dangerous, let's dive a little deeper. So certain free apps are made by rogue developers or hackers with malicious intent. And there are two main ways they can get to you. The first is by tracking you. So if your free photo editor or your free astrology app is requesting to access, is requesting access to your contacts or location, you should be suspicious because trackers are built into some of these free apps to record your movements, which could tell them your home address, how much you earn, where you work, what gym you go to, who you talk to, and also how often you do so. And finally, who you visit and how often you see them as well. Um, adversaries and third parties um, pay big money for consumer data like this. And hackers who see you as a target will definitely find plenty of malicious ways to exploit your information. The second way in which uh, free applications can be dangerous to you is that they can be used to infect your device. So malware can be easily planted in some of these free applications to take your device over. Once your device is infected, the malware could steal your photos, videos, payment information, name, or any other sensitive information that you might have on your device. Similarly, spyware can be planted in some of these free apps as well to track and record your phone calls, your messages, other movements, as well as hacking into your camera. Um, another thing which is really scary is obviously stealing of more private information because free apps can capture your email, phone number, and even your credit card numbers. Um, unfortunately, free apps will also allow you to access sensitive data on the web, which increases the risk of free app theft and malware theft. Finally, one of the main dangers of free apps is that they, be more, they may be used as Trojan horses to install other free applications on your device. And one type of Trojan horse is an overlay. So Trojans and overlays are dangerous because they can trick the device user into installing a hidden software. And often the installation process will not be evident to you. And free apps may ask for permission that they shouldn't need or want. The danger is that one program could be install, installed without your knowledge and then potentially take over your device if it turns out to be malicious. So uh, after learning all of this, one might wonder how, if it's so dangerous to have free apps, why are they still being made? And how do so many malicious app developers get away with this? So first, they get away with this by keeping the data absolutely anonymous. Um, it's also very important to know that they do a really poor job at making the data anonymous as well. So um, 
making it extremely easy for anybody with access to raw data to be able to relate that to a particular individual. Next thing, uh, they really write hard to understand in really long terms and conditions on purpose, which would force the user to simply grant access to something they wouldn't normally do. And finally, uh, they just do not give a damn about your privacy because there are really no consequences other than bad press, which too gets forgotten very soon. So with all of these dangerous things out there, what can you do to protect your data? And we have with this finally reached our last section of this session. So some of the best practices that I'd like to discuss with you are on your screen. So before you install any app, avoid granting excessive permissions. Really think about what an app needs the permissions, what and why that app needs those permissions that it's requesting. If the permissions seem extremely excessive, ask yourself if it's likely that they are simply to acquire, uh, simply to acquire any data about you. Um, next best practice is ideally try to not sign into an app using your social media sites or accounts. If you do, please check what data the app will receive from the social network account as well. And if you do sign into apps using your social networking accounts, please be extremely frugal about how much information you provide in your public profiles on or on your social networking sites. You can also change permissions of certain apps that you have already downloaded. So if you are an Android user, go to settings, find the permissions page, pane and uh, reduce the number of permissions that you have granted to an application on your phone. Similarly, for iOS users, go to settings and under privacy, you have you will have options to edit the permissions that you are providing to your applications. Next, next best practice is uh, to be wary about installing browsers, browser toolbars and extensions. So often these free apps attempt to um, install toolbars from websites you have rarely ever used or browser extensions that do things to you that you do not need. And these really shady toolbars and extensions can actually steal your information uh, or they can slow down your system in a way that your browser will need minutes instead of seconds to load. Um, other free softwares can also trick you into accepting to install toolbars and extensions that you do not really need. So definitely read uh, the terms and conditions um, to understand what you are getting into and make sure to uncheck or decline any offers uh, for toolbars or any browser add-ons. Say no to software that you do not need. Say no to apps that you have never heard of and even to special offers that are bundled together. So besides toolbars and uh, uh, add-ons, there are also other kinds of software that are alter alternatively offered or forced when installing free apps and games. Uh, for example, fake browsers, which can easily be modified and um, they would include an unwanted piece of functionality that does something to your system. Um, it might monitor your activity or steal your personal information. So please stick to browsers that are widely known like Google Chrome, Mozilla Firefox, uh, Microsoft Edge, etc. Check your um, system for any viruses, trojans, and adware. It's one, it's another one of those problems that can be a risk with uh, downloading any new applications. So having a robust antivirus software on your devices is a must if you are uh, downloading any new apps. And for an added layer of protection, you can also scan each files you download before you install it to see how much of a risk it is. And the way you can do this is by using a handle little web service called Virus Total. So you just simply go to Virus Total website and upload a file and it will generate a report to you telling you all about how risky that installation file is. Um, you may also download a VPN on your phone and your machine to um, add a defense in depth. Uh, you should also make sure that you are visiting websites with HTTPS. Um, and if you forget about this, you can consider installing HTTPS Everywhere extension. 
um, which automa- uh, uh, which automatically directs you to the secure version of a site when the site supports that. And it makes it difficult for an attacker, especially if you are on a public Wi-Fi at a coffee shop or at an airport or even at a hotel. Um, and it will disable the attacker to digitally eavesdrop on what you're doing. Uh, definitely use official app stores only. Um, this is to reduce the risk of installing potentially harmful applications. Download applications only from official app stores. Um, Finally, know what information the app will be able to access. So before you download any app, um, and I've mentioned this before, please read the app's privacy policy to see how your data will be used or if your data will be shared with other companies. Um, Is the policy vague about how the app will share your data? Um, And if it is, or if you are not comfortable with how your information could be shared by downloading this app, you might want to find Um, an alternative app and you should definitely not install the app which is not giving you enough information about how your personal data will be used. Uh, Always keep your your device and your apps updated. Uh, Apps with out-of-date software may be at a risk of being hacked. They'll have several vulnerabilities. So protect your devices from malware by installing automatic app updates as soon as they are released. Uh, Finally, you must delete apps you do not need. So to avoid any unnecessary data collection, if you are not using an app, please go through your phone and delete any apps that are not in use anymore. And this was it for the presentation, everyone. These are a few references that I used to um, create this session for you. I learned a lot from these references as well. So please feel free to go to these links and learn more yourself. And it's been a pleasure uh, presenting. Huge shout out to Diana Initiative for letting me share my thoughts. And for any further questions, I will be available throughout this presentation. I will be at the AWS booth as well. Again, my name is Ruchra Pokhreal. Have a wonderful day and have a great time at the conference. And I'll see you soon. Bye-bye. I was checking to see if she was on the Discord. Um, She is not, I don't know if she's out at the AWS booth here. Maybe she was at Black Hat, I don't know. Um, She hasn't answered, but it was a great talk, right? Does anybody have any questions? Because I can put them in and we'll see if she responds at some point. Nope. Cool. Who has an afternoon joke? (laughs) Oh, wait, are you gonna, are you? Oh, I thought you were gonna tell us an afternoon joke. Darn. I get it, okay. (laughs) Well, you have to go to the mic. No, the joke is I um, I work in cybersecurity. I'm able to work remotely at home. I'm 26, live with my parents uh, back in their uh, Pennsylvania house. So I live at home. I work at home. I happen to drive uh, a retiree's favorite car, a Lincoln, and I also enjoy golf and skiing. So I retired at 26. I'm like living the life I dream of later. It's really, it's really kind of a joke that falls flat, but it's just like, wait, isn't this like what people do like when they move to Florida or something? Yeah. <laughs>